22, September 10th, 2022. Do you know this is the Torah portion when you divide the Torah up into 52 portions that has more commandments than any other Torah portion? Now, Deuteronomy 21, verse 10, where it begins, it begins with when you go to war against your enemies, there are rules of war. <clears throat> and it's when you go to war, and we'll be talking uh, the second half of the service about Ephesians and the armor of God. How many of you, when you go to war, want to have the right armor on? That's very important, and we're going to see that. <laughs> and there's a lots of different levels of war, right? I will explain. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17, if a man have two wives, he will have war. <laughs> Not real smart. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you something very humorous. When we were in Turkey and Greece, we have our Turkish guides, and of course the Turkish guides were Islamic, uh, and of course English wasn't their first language. Uh, and, and so they were talking, and, and they said, now what's the difference between complete and finished? Are those the same thing, complete and finished? And we go, well, basically, yeah. And he goes, well, then how come if you marry the right person, you're complete, and if you marry the wrong one, you're finished? <laughs> I thought that was great. Okay, so here we go to Deuteronomy 21, 50 through 17. And if one is beloved and one is hated, now what does this remind you of? Jacob, 400 years. This is several hundred years earlier. Hopefully we learn from history. If we don't learn from history, we're going to repeat it. Okay. He says, and they both have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. If the firstborn son be hers that was hated, it'll be when he makes his sons to inherit what he has. He cannot make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated who is actually the firstborn. He has to acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn. How? By giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. Wow. <clears throat> so anyways, that's how this Torah portion begins. And then we're going to jump to chapter 22, <clears throat> and it says, you shall not see your brother's ox. Now, do you remember in the Gospels, this guy says, uh, you know, who's my brother? Remember that? How do you define that? Well, let's see how the Torah defines it. He says, you don't see your brother's ox or sheep going astray and then hide yourself. You will in any case bring them back to your brother. And if your brother doesn't live close to you or if you don't know him. So here's a brother who's supposed to be a brother who you don't even know. How can it be a brother? I don't even know him. Interesting. It says, then... You shall bring it to your own house, this ox or sheep, and it's to be with you until your brother comes looking for it. And then you have to restore it to him again. You can't lie. Well, that's mine. I've had it for two years. Let's say it's been two years before he comes and he finally gets it. You can't lie. It says here, in like manner, you're to do with his donkey, you to do with his clothes, and with all lost things, your, your brothers, which he has lost, and you have found, you shall do likewise. You may not hide yourself. Wow. So this Torah portion begins with lost and found. If someone loses something and you have it and you know it wasn't yours, the Bible does not teach finders, keepers, losers, weepers. But here's the thing. Let's say you've taken that sheep in that was lost and you've cared for it for two years and you probably put thousands of dollars into feeding it and caring for it and now when he comes to get it, you have to just give it back. Or you could go, I'm not under the law. I don't have to do that. Wow. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean you're not under the law? The law was not to save you. The law was to tell you how to morally behave. Okay, so... Here's the legalist. The legalist would say, I didn't, found, I didn't find his ox or donkey. I found his cash. So therefore, I can keep it. No! The Torah is like case law, where if, 
you learn that the heart of the lawgiver, which is the Messiah, and then the legalists will try to, uh, as you know, lawyers, what do they try to do? They try to find loopholes. The legalist today is the one who tries to find the loopholes uh, and say, well, I don't have to return, uh, let's see, his camel, because it only said ox or sheep or donkey. No, that's what the legalist does. The non-legalist says, wow, look at God's heart. He wants to make sure we return the lost thing. So I don't say I'm not under the law. I say, look, this is what we learned from this. We're to understand the deeper principles of the law. Look at Exodus 23, verse 5, for example. This referred to a brother that you may not even know. But what happens if it's your neighbor you can't stand? It's someone you hate. Look what Exodus 23, 5 says. If you see the donkey of him who hates you lying under his burden and you don't want to help him, you shall surely help him. So even if this is someone who you know, it may even be a brother or not a brother, but it says here, not that you hate him, but he hates you. Maybe you don't, you don't, you're indifferent, but you know this person hates you. You still, if his donkey is under a burden, you still are supposed to go and help. Or do we say, I'm not under the law. I don't have to help him. That doesn't make sense. Look at Deuteronomy 22, 4. You shall not see your brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way and then hide yourself. You will surely help him to lift them up again. So what the Bible is teaching us, it doesn't matter if it's friend or foe, we have to help them when they are in need. <clears throat> With these commandments, what we have to look at is what is God trying to tell us about himself? He's saying help the helpless regardless. You know, that's what he wants us to do, to have a heart of love, grace, kindness, helping, even, in, even if they don't love you or hate you. Oftentimes, that's how you win the person who hates you, is when you go and you do something when they need it. Now, Deuteronomy 22, uh, let's look at verse 6 and 7. Here it talks about a bird's nest. If you happen to go buy a bird's nest in a tree or on the ground, like killed deer, they build their nest on the ground, those little birds. And it says, whether they're young ones or eggs, and the mama is sitting on the young or on the eggs, <coughs> do not take the mama with the young, but you shall in any way let the mama go and take the young to you, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. Oh my goodness, do you realize, here's a commandment for, I mean, talk about, um, uh, living well of water that you can live forever. God is saying, hey, you want to prolong your days? Be nice to the little birds. Again, too often the mighty, the powerful want to crush those who are the least because they want to have power and control. God, who is the mightiest, the strongest, and most powerful, is also the most tender. He says, look, if you really want to be mighty, powerful, it's going to be based on how kind you are to the, that's why he always wants to take care of the widows, the orphans, the homeless, all these things. So we're trying to learn from God's character. <coughs> what this tells us, when we look at this, as we analyze it, don't be cruel to the mom. Don't let the mom see you take her kids away. All right? Don't use her instincts against her either as a trap to capture her. So this verse instructs one to chase the mother hen from its nest before taking its fledglings. Now, on a deeper level, this law reflects the state of the Jewish people in exile. The Shekinah left, okay? And they've all been scattered around the world in exile. The mother bird who's been chased away cries over the separation from her children just as... The Messiah, God cried over the separation of him from his kids. When her cries were heard on high, the angels asked the Lord, why is he commanded that the mother bird suffer such a sad fate? And God answers that it's because he shares the same fate as the mother bird. 
His presence has been driven from the holy temple. His children have been taken into exile. And God asked that the angels sympathize with his plight and the plight of the Jewish people. He demands that they pray for the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and for the restoration of the temple so that once again his presence will be able to dwell in Jerusalem. So this is the parallel. And I will prove it. Look at Luke chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Yeshua says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to her. How often I want to gather your children as a hen gathers her own brood under her wings, but you refused. Behold, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch Abba, Shem Adonai. So here, they were like uh, little chicks, and Yeshua was like the mother hen. He was driven away. By his own kids. But he wants to bring them back. Now, Deuteronomy 23, verse 7 and 8. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Oh, my gosh. When that guy in the gospel says, who's my brother? He could have said, well, the Edomite. He came from Esau. Jacob and Esau are brothers. And they hate each other. But he says, you're not to hate the Edomite. How can you command someone in one sense not to hate? That's an emotion, you know, but we have to control these things. Wow. And that says you're not to abhor an Egyptian. What? They're the ones who bat me in slavery for 200 years. What do you mean we can't hate the Egyptian? It says because you were a stranger in his land, the children that are begotten of them, they still get to enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. Wow, so the Edomite is my brother, the Egyptian is my brother. And then look at Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. When you vow a vow to the Lord your God, don't be slack to pay it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you still want a vow, it shall be, if you don't want a vow, it's not a sin not to vow. But, he says, that which has gone out of your lips, you're going to keep it and you're going to perform it. Even a free will offering according as you vowed to the Lord your God, which you promised with your mouth. That's why. Don't make promises. Don't make vows. Just do it. Then if you don't do it, it's not like you've made a vow. I mean, it really is dumb to make a vow. Just do what you want to do. And then when you stop doing it, it's, your, it's not a sin unto you. How many of us I know that that's important? But how often does it take place in an email? And then we wish we grabbed it back. Okay, Deuteronomy 23, 24, and 25. When you come to your neighbor's vineyard, look at this. You can eat grapes out of your neighbor's vineyard at your own pleasure to your full. But you can't put any in your vessel or in your pocket or things like that. When you come into the standing corn of your neighbor, you can pluck the ears with your hand, but you not to move a sickle to your neighbor's standing corn. Okay, so here's the thing. Let me go here. You're walking through a vineyard. You can take some of the grapes. It's not a problem, but you can't fill your pockets. When you're going through the field, whatever it is, you can take, but you can't take a sickle to it, okay? Look at this. In Matthew 12, verse 1 and 2. At that time, Yeshua went on the Sabbath day, too, through the grain fields. His disciples were hungry and began to pluck the heads of grain and to eat. But the Pharisees, when they saw it, said to him, Behold, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. First off, the Torah just says it's lawful when you're going through to do it. Second off, They misunderstood the Sabbath. They're not working because they're not harvesting. They're just eating what's right there in front of them. So Yeshua had to let them. So some people say, see, Yeshua broke the Sabbath. No, he didn't break the Sabbath. He was telling them they misunderstood the laws of the Sabbath. That's why it was okay. Now, let me explain. uh, Let's see. Oh, what do I want to do? Okay. Look at uh, Deuteronomy 24, 8 and 9. It says, remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam, by the way, after you came out of Egypt. Does anyone remember what the Lord God did to Miriam? Leprosy. 
And guess what? That is not Hansen's disease. It's not like we think of modern leprosy. It was a spiritual disease that was physically manifested. Uh, and the reason we know this is because houses could get leprosy. Garments could get leprosy. All right? Uh, but look at Proverbs 18.21. It's based on what she said. And it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it are going to eat the fruit. You can either speak death or you can speak life, but it is going to affect you. Proverbs 20, uh, 15, 2 through 4. It says, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge of right, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. We need to control our tongue, even as it says in the book of James. We've got to control our tongue. God created the world through speech. We can create or kill people through our speech. Now, look at Deuteronomy 24, 14 and 15. You shall not oppress a hired servant. That means an employee. This is some, a servant. It's not a slave. This is an employee that is poor and needy. Whether he is of your brothers or a stranger... That's in your land within your gates. At his day, that means payday, on his payday, you shall give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down on it, for he's poor, and he sets his heart on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and be sent to you. Wow. Let's look at this. This is saying to the employers, you have to pay your employee on payday. Right? Right? But what if your employer says, I'm not under the law. I don't have to pay you on payday. <laughs> Wait a minute. We have to see. So the, the law is so misunderstood. The, we're to learn these principles. Well, that's not one of the big ten. Nowhere in the Ten Commandments does it say you have to pay your employees on payday. So therefore, it doesn't apply. That's craziness. Okay. Look at Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. When you cut down your harvest in your field and you forgot a sheaf in the field, don't go again to fetch it. It's for the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the bows again. It's to, for the stranger, the fatherless, the widow. It's just like the little baby birds. God is caring for the, the unfortunate. He says, when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean it afterwards. It's for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Okay, again, I don't have to take care of the fatherless, the stranger, and the widow because I'm not a farmer. That law was only for farmers. No, wrong no, again. Or I'm not under the law. Therefore, I don't have to do that. Wrong again. We have to understand the whole concept and nature of the Torah. What is God trying to teach us about himself? The laws of any place tells you the morality of the governor. Look at Illinois. With the laws they're creating, what does that tell you about that government? When we read the laws of Torah, it's not to be thought of as a bunch of do's and don'ts and oh, save, not save. It's look at the governor. Who are we serving? What is he asking? What type of a governor do we have? Actually, the more laws you have, it's because how lawless you are. There would not have to be a law, don't steal, if people didn't steal. Look how many laws we have. Look at the IRS books. Okay. Now look at this one. Deuteronomy 25.4. You shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the corn. Wow. Here you have, it's not a person, it's an animal, and he's working hard. You're not to muzzle him. You're to allow him to eat what, as he's working. Okay, God even cares about animals. But here's the thing. Look at 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18 in the New Testament. Paul says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine, for the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the grain and the labor is worthy of his reward. Okay, now wait a minute. What does that have to do with not muzzling an ox? He came out with another level of interpretation. 
for those of you that aren't aware, within Judaism, they have different levels of understanding. And it's called pardes, which means garden. But the P stands for peshat, which means the plain meaning of the text. When it says don't muzzle the ox, what does that mean? Don't muzzle the ox. Okay. Then there is a remez, which means a hint at another meaning. And this Paul is saying, well, hey, that gives us a hint that it also could apply to the teacher who's teaching you, you know, reward them. Well, when he did that, that doesn't mean we can now muzzle the ox because we found a new interpretation. You follow me? Some people think just because we found a new interpretation, then that is wrong. The next level is a drash or an allegory which is like uh, Sarah is heavenly Jerusalem and Hagar's earthly Jerusalem, okay? And then lastly is the sowed, which means that which is hidden, secret. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's Proverbs 25, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, it's the honor of kings to search it out. God loves to play hide and seek, and he wants people to search for him. Okay, uh, and then look at Deuteronomy 25, 15, and 16. You're to have perfect and just weights, a perfect and just measure that your days may be lengthened. Here again is another way to have a long life. Be honest, be fair. And then lastly, we have Amalek. What time is it? Oh, I got to hurry. Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19, it also says, remember what Amalek did when you came out of Egypt, he met you and he smote the weakest behind you, all that were feeble when you were faint and weary. He didn't fear God. Therefore, it'll be when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies in the land that your Lord your God gives you for an inheritance. You shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven and don't you forget it. Okay, so remember not to forget to forget something like that. Okay, the Hop Torah, we're going to wrap things up. Let me see real quick here. Yep. Okay. Look at Isaiah 54, 1 through 3. The Hop Torah, for those that don't know, means a portion of the prophets that ties into the Torah portion. And it says, Single barren, you that didn't bear, break forth into singing, cry aloud, you that didn't travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, stretch out your curtains of your habitations, don't spare, lengthen your cords, strengthen your strikes, stakes, for you are going to break forth on the right and on the left, and your seed is going to do what? Inherit the Gentiles. Wow. Incredible. And then in verse 5 through 7, he says, your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall be he be called, for the Lord has called you as a woman forsaken, grieved in spirit, a wife of youth, when you were refused, said your God, for a small moment i forsaken you, but with what? Great mercies, he's going to gather Israel back again. And then it goes on to say, in verse 8 through 10, In a little wrath I hid my face from you, but for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you, said the Lord your Redeemer, for this is just as the waters of Noah. Here it is. I as, just as I sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. The mountains will depart, the hills be removed, but my kindness will not depart from you, neither will the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on you. Wow. That's amazing. A lot of people say, well, uh, uh, God forsook the Jews because of what they did to Jesus. No, right here. It says that's not true. But, the month of Elul is known as the month of what? Return. Return. And what will be just studied? If something is lost, what are you supposed to do? And so when we find lost souls, what are we supposed to do? Return them. And if we're lost, what are we supposed to do? Return. Repentance doesn't mean turn around. Repentance means go home. Okay, and look at Malachi 3, 7. Even from the days of your fathers, you're gone away from my ordinances. You've not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. And then uh, we'll close with Matthew 24 from the Brit Hadashah. He says, just as lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And then Matthew 24, 7, nation will rise against nation. That really means ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. And there's going to be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and there's been a big spike in that. And finally, verse 32 through 34, learn a parable of the fig tree, which is Israel. 
when its branch is tender and puts forth leaves, know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things happening, know that it is near, even at the doors. Bear, I say to you, this generation will not pass till everything is fulfilled. And I've got a whole other hour teaching on that. So, but let's stand. We'll pray, uh, and then we'll have a 20-minute break, and then we'll have about 20 minutes of worship, and then we'll come back and go through Ephesians. I think we're going to close Ephesians today. All right, Avinu Mokainu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for your Torah. Father, I pray that you've given all of us your heart. We just want to lean upon you and feel your heartbeat. We want to know what you want and what you desire because our goal is not to please ourselves. Our goal is to please you. And Father, I just thank you so much for all those around the world that are watching, all those around the United States that are watching, and all those that are here locally. We're excited about the fall feast coming. Uh, we can hardly wait to see what you do. Uh, and uh, Father, we just thank you for all those in the meantime, when this time is so short, that so into this ministry, that so into your word, that it can go forth throughout all the world. In Yeshua's name, amen, together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break and let the visitors cut in line downstairs. So we're going to look at the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to share with you something that is mind-blowing. Okay, as you know, I was just in all seven churches this last week, and in Philippi, and Athens, and Corinth. And uh, one of the things I want to show you, if you remember last week, I told you, if you remember when they were all uh, in Acts 19, uh, in Ephesus, they were all shouting for two hours, great is the goddess Diana of the Ephesians. That's where it was happening. And that's, I, that's me down there at the very bottom. Uh, but that's how big that audience was when for two hours they were yelling out, great is the goddess of the Ephesians. Now, just down the street from this was the Ephesus library that had about 20 thousand scrolls or books in it enormous and that is on another side of the well you go down the street and so here we are we're going down the street the library is on one side and all of these ancient ruins from 2,000 years ago are on the other side and so as you're going down to the street I want you to imagine 2,000 years ago you're going down the street you can go to the right or you can go to the left to the right is the library, and what was this to the left? Well, it so happens there was, in the stones pavement as you're walking, this was in the stone pavement. You see the foot? Here's a lady with kind of like a feathered hat or something, and then you see a heart over there, and I want you to notice this is the left foot. And it tells you what is on the left side of the street. In Ephesus, we saw one of the oldest advertisements of the world. On the pavement, there was, a displayed, there was displayed the face of a lady, a heart, and a left foot. It was an advertisement about the brothel that was across the library, which indicated that the brothel was on the left side of the pedestrian walkway. There was also an inscription, but it had eroded in time. So 2,000 years ago, here we're looking at this advertisement in the stone payment. Go to the left. Well, guess what? Last week in Ephesians, it was all about our walk. It's all about our walk. Do we want to go to the left? Do we want to go to the right? So the other thing that I want to talk about is Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. We talked, I think it's so amazing how this ties into this morning's tour portion about we're in a war. How many of you know we're in a war? And is it against each other or flesh against spirit? Okay, well, look at Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on what? The whole armor of God. Hmm, that means God has armor. Do you think God has on a Roman soldier costume? Okay, no. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
But we're wrestling against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take indeed the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So is our fight with flesh and blood. Okay, so why do they say the armor of God is fighting with flesh and blood? That is completely wrong. It's no wonder Christians are always fighting each other. Because they think the armor of God is Roman soldier armor and they're cutting each other up into pieces. There's so much friendly fire within the church. It's horrible. But the problem is, look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 2, 4. The weapons of our warfare are what? They're not carnal. So why in the world are we saying it is a Roman soldier costume? So I'm going to tell you what the armor of God is really is today. Look at Matthew 4, 4. When Yeshua is being tested in the wilderness by a spirit in high places, Satan, he said, it is what? Written. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then verse 7, he said to him again, it is written again, not to tempt the Lord your God. Matthew 4, 10, Yeshua said to him, get out of here, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So, what is one of the weapons of our warfare? The word of God. Okay, now, look at Numbers, chapter 31, verse 6. Moses sent everyone to the war, a thousand from each tribe, together with Phinehas. The son of Eleazar, the priest with the vessels of the sanctuary, the trumpet for the alarm in his hand. So here we see Phineas, who is a priest. The priests are leading the battle. Look at Exodus 39, 22, and 23. It says, the robe which went with the ephod, now this, these are the priestly garments, was made of blue with a hole at the top in the middle, like the hole in the coat of a fighting man edged with a band to make it strong. The priestly garments were made as the coat of a fighter, of a warrior. Look at Numbers 4.30. From 30 years old and upward, even to 50 years old, shall you number them, everyone that enters into the service to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. Do you know what? The word service here can have different meanings. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of a joke. <clears throat> there was this little kid, and it was Memorial Weekend, and he's at church, and he was going to a church where the service took forever. And he looks over, and he sees all these different flags, and he points to one of the flags and says, Daddy, what's that? And Daddy said, well, those were all the people that died in the service. And he goes, was that the first service or the second service? <laughs> this is taking forever. Okay. But get a load of this. The word service here in Hebrew is sava. Remember? Adonai savaot. Savaot. Sava means armies. He's the Lord of hosts. When it talks about the priests enter into the service, they're talking about military service. The priests were soldiers with their garments. That word sava means, if you look it up, it's a mass of people organized for war, an army, a campaign, a battle, host service soldiers waiting upon warfare. So the priests had military garments. 2 Samuel 7, 26, and let your name be made great forever and let men say the Lord of hosts or Lord of armies. It's the same Hebrew word as it's used there in the service. All right, so in uh, Exodus 28, verse 3 through 4, let me see where I'm at here. Okay, here we go. Here's the, the garments of the priests that they would wear. And here we see that the Lord is the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. And here we have a, a religious soldier who's praying to the Lord of hosts. 
Now, in Ezekiel, let's go here for a minute. Let's look at 28, verse 3 and 4. He says, you shall speak to all that are wise-hearted, whom I filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. And then he says, these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a broidered coat, a miter, a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. So here's a picture of the high priest. But on Yom Kippur, as you know, the high priestly garments came off and everyone would be in white. Now, so Isaiah, here comes, here comes. Isaiah 59, verse 16 and 17. God says he saw that there was nobody and he wondered why there was no intercessor. He's always looking for intercessors. Therefore, his arm brought salvation to himself and his righteousness. It sustained him. Now look at this. It speaks of God here. And he says he put on righteousness as a breastplate, a helmet of salvation. And of course, the Hebrew for salvation is Yeshua. He has on the helmet of Yeshua upon his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Guess what? The armor of God is not a Roman soldier costume. The armor of God is the priestly garments. Now, specific garments were used only for Yom Kippur. Now, the armor of God is for the one who's going to be standing in the gap by intercessory prayer. Against who? The accuser of the brethren. The, bro- uh, the accuser of the brethren wants to accuse all of your brothers and sisters. We need to counteract that and be intercessors. Look at uh, Ephesians 6, 14 and 15. He says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with what? Truth. Have on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The breastplate of righteousness is not a Roman soldier breastplate. It's the high priest's breastplate. That is the breastplate of the armor of God. Now, let's look at this. Uh, So this here is not what he's talking about. And he's not talking about a shield of a Roman shield. He's talking about an all-encompassing force shield. And I will show that to you. Let's look at this. Uh, and if you'll notice, let me go back here a second. Oop, wrong way. You'll notice the priests never wore shoes. Never. Because they're standing on holy ground. And so they don't have on Roman shoes either. But we're going to get to that in a moment. Okay. So here we are. It says here, um, uh, Leviticus 16.32. The priest who's to be anointed and who will be consecrated to be the priest in his father's stead shall make the atonement and he shall put on the linen garments, even the holy garments. So now he has to take one garment off and put on the holy garments. Let's take a look at what some of them are. Let me see. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go here. I'm going to jump here for a moment. Okay. It says, uh, so let's look at the Leviticus 8, 7. And put on him the coat and girded him with the girdle, clothed him with the robe, put the ephod on him, he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him therewith. So that is one thing. But look at this, Isaiah 11, 5, righteousness is the girdle of his loins, faithfulness is the girdle of his reins. And again, that word in Hebrew means to be as an armed soldier equipped for the fight. And so now, let me go back here, right there. Okay, so here we are in Exodus 28, 29, and 30. It says, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And you will put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thummim, and they'll be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron will bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Okay, do you remember everything that was done in the temple on earth was patterned after the one in heaven? 
That means Yeshua has on a breastplate with the names of the children of Israel on it. That's his armor. Okay, now, going back to the feet, the priests had to be barefoot. Can you imagine in the middle of winter, you're barefoot on cold marble floors? That will keep you awake. We know from Exodus 3, 5, he said uh, to Moses, don't draw close, put off your shoes, come off your feet, but you're standing on holy ground. In Joshua 5, 15, the captain of the Lord of hosts says to Joshua, take off your shoes because the place you're standing is holy. Well, it's the same thing. So the priest would not have, uh, you know, forget the Roman soldier costume completely. Matter of fact, look at Isaiah 52, 7. It says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the shoes. No. It says the feet of him that brings the gospel, the good tidings, that's uh, good tidings, is the gospel. That publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publishes Yeshua, salvation. That says to Zion, your God reigns. Well, guess what? Let's look at Ephesians 6, 16 and 17. In addition to all these, take up the shield of faithfulness with which you'll be able to quench all the flaming darts of the wicked one. Moreover, put on the helmet of of salvation and take up the sword of the spirit which is the word of god so we have to understand these are spiritual things so when you think about this it says look at psalm 84 11 the lord god is a sun and a shield he is not a little shield he is a big shield as a matter of fact just as sunlight completely surrounds you the Lord God is a sun and shield. That's a comparison. He's a shield like the sun. And just like the sun completely surrounds you, so does his shield. Which is why in Isaiah 59, 11, slay them not, lest my people forget, scatter them by your power, and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. So the Lord is our shield. And he's not a little puny Roman soldier shield. As a matter of fact, look at Psalm 91, 4 and 5. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you will trust his truth will be your shield and buckler. You will not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Why? Because God is not just a little shield in the front. He's a, like a force shield. As a matter of fact, look at Psalm 115, 11 and 13. You that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their what? Shield. And the Lord's been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless the, those that fear the Lord, both small and great. So when Ephesians talks about the shield, it's God himself as a force shield. And now, it also talks in Ephesians about the helmet of Yeshua or the helmet of salvation. There's your helmet. Okay. In Exodus 39, 30 and 31, they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold. They wrote upon it a writing like the engravings of a signet, which says, Kadosh la Adonai. Okay, holy to the Lord. And they tied it on a lace of blue to fasten it upon his mitre as the Lord commanded Moses. There is your helmet of salvation. Here is the sword, which is the word of God. Revelation 19, 13 through 15. Messiah was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called what? And then at look, what do we find? We have armies are in heaven are falling upon white horses. And what are they clothed in? A Roman soldier costume? No, they're clothed in the garments of the priests. And these are armies. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And what is that? The word of God. That he would smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the wine press in the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. We have to realize when we look at the book of Revelation that we just read, that is a Yom Kippur event. This event will happen on Yom Kippur. Everyone knows throughout thousands of years, everyone on Yom Kippur comes dressed in white. And this is why they're all on white horses, dressed in white, because this is a Yom Kippur event. When Yeshua comes back, he's going to be making war, and he's going to come back not in a Roman soldier costume. 
is coming back as a priest. So this is not the armor of God. Do you think Yeshua is going to look like this when he comes back? I don't think so. Matter of fact, that's what would be considered strange apparel. Matter of fact, in Leviticus 16.4, he shall put on the linen coat. He'll have on the linen breeches. He'll be have the girded the linen girdle, the linen miter. He'll be attired. These are holy garments. Okay, so it's on Yom Kippur when they come in white and everyone comes in white. And in Revelation, when we read this, when we make the connections, we see this event will be the fulfillment of Yom Kippur some year. In Isaiah 11.4, with righteousness, he'll judge the poor. He'll reprove uh, with equity the meek of the earth. He'll smite the earth with what? The rod of his mouth. That's the word of God. He's just like when he spoke and creation came, he's going to speak and it is over. In Second Chronicles, uh, but it says, he'll, with the breath of his lips, he'll slay the wicked. Second Chronicles 6.41. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with what? In other words, we're supposed to be clothed with Yeshua. That's the Hebrew. We are clothed with Yeshua. Isaiah 61.10 goes on to say, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of Yeshua He's covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. This is a wedding invitation, guys. Here we go. Your name written right there. Here's the invitation to Messiah's wedding. How many of you want to be there? Woohoo! Okay. Well, we got to have on the right garments when we go to the wedding. Watch what happens. Just before is a wedding. In Revelation 19, 13 through 15 was when he comes with an army of, it, it, we just read, right? And they're all clothed in white on white horses. But look what happens just before that event. There's a wedding taking place in verse 7 through 9. And look what it says. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. She was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. So after she's arrayed in fine linen, clean and white from the wedding, then she comes on the horses. You see the, how it goes? All right. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. But guess what? The fine linen is the garments that he gave his bride to wear. We're not coming in our own righteous clothing. We have to wear the garments that the king, the groom, provided us. Watch this. This is, this is going to be mind-blowing. You buckled in? You got on your shoulder straps? Go to the Gospels, Matthew 22, 1 through 4. Yeshua answered and spoke to them again by parables, and he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call those who were bidden to the wedding, and they wouldn't come. So he sent forth other servants and said, Tell them which are bidden, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready to come to the marriage. Can you believe there are going to be people that don't want to come to the marriage? Wow. And so the king is upset. And so look what happens in verse 7 through 10. The king was angry, and so he sent his what? Armies. Those who had put his servants to death, he gave to destruction, burning down their town with fire. And he said to his servants, the feast is ready, but the guests were not good enough. Go to the crossroads. Get all those whom you see to come to the wedding feast. And those servants went out into the streets and got together all those whom they came across, bad and good, and the feast was full of guests. Our job is not to clean them. Our job is to bring them the bad and the good. We don't clean them. God cleans them. Okay? We can't. Oh, I don't think God wants you. Okay? And so look what happens, though, in Matthew 22, 11 through 13. When the king comes in to look at all the guests, he saw there was someone who did not have on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how in the world did you get in here without a wedding garment? 
And the man was speechless. And so the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Okay, now I'm going to blow your minds here. There are going to be believers that don't make it to the wedding. They go through the tribulation because they have their own garments. Okay? Look at this. Where did that parable that he shared come from? It came from Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Look at this. And those who are turned back from the Lord, and those who have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for him, hold your peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, and he's bidden his guests. And it will come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the princes, the king's children, and all who are clothed with strange apparel. Wow. Do you know the priest, if he wasn't in his uniform serving in the temple, he was like a stranger serving before the Lord. The priest could not have on his regular garments and be a priest. He had to take off his clothes and put on the priestly garments to serve as a priest. Now, here we go. Listen to this. It's mind-blowing. Luke 12, 34 through 36. Where your treasure is, that where is where your heart will be. Also, let your loins be girded about, your lights burning, and you yourselves like men that wait for the Lord when he returns from the wedding. So that when he comes and knocks them, he opened them immediately. Here are his servants that don't make it to the wedding. They go through the tribulation. And it's only when he returns from the wedding and he comes back that they finally open the door immediately. Right there it tells you. These are going to be believers. And it says he will, dress, he will dress himself and he'll serve them and everything. They don't get to come for the wedding or the meal. They just get the dessert. Because they came in strange apparel. And I'm going to explain that. Look at Jude 1, 23. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment that is what? Spotted by the flesh. Those believers that are still living in the flesh are going to have to be refined through the fire. Here's one thing. Let me show you this. Here, let's say, is the official wedding garment that comes. The king would have wealthy people and poor people in his kingdom, and he wants everyone to come to the wedding because he loves his son, so everyone in the kingdom is invited, but some people don't have nice clothes, other people do. So the king would provide garments for everybody. The nice thing about this official wedding garment, it has been made white by the blood of the lamb. That's what he's given to each and every one of us. But some don't want his garment. They want to come in their own finery. Look what I've done for you. Look at all my wonderful works. Rather than look at all the works you did through me, it's look at all the works I did for you. This is strange apparel. This is us coming with garments stained by the flesh. As a matter of fact, look at 1 Samuel 17, 38, 39. Saul armed David with his armor. He put on the helmet of brass. He armed him with the coat of mail. David girded his sword upon his armor. And he, he didn't want to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I can't go with these. I've not proved them. So David took them off. And then what in 1 Samuel 17, 45? David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a Roman soldier costume. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And so here you see the armor of God. This is what the armor of God should look like. There is your helmet of salvation. There is your belt of truth. There is your breastplate of righteousness. Here are the feet with the gospel of peace prepared with nothing of flesh or man made between you and God. Here is your sword of the spirit. Here is the shield. It's like a force shield, okay? Uh, he is there. So that is what your armor of God is. And then in Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, 
It says, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer, making requests by supplication. Keep on the alert with perseverance on behalf of all the holy people. Pray for me that I may be o- able to open my mouth and have the right words to make the mystery of the go- good news teaching known to people with clarity through bold proclamation. For this cause, I'm an ambassador who's locked in chains in order that I might speak with boldness. Who would have thought if you're locked in chains, you could speak with boldness? But he does. So we're going to close the book of Ephesians with chapter 6, 21 through 23. This is all so that you may know about my circumstances and how I am doing. Tychicus, the much beloved brother and faithful servant minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. I send him to you to accomplish his purpose so that you may know all about us and so that he will give comfort to your hearts. Here he is in chains, but he's trying to give comfort to them. May shalom be given to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God, the Father and the Lord Yeshua, the anointed one. May grace be with all those who love our Lord Yeshua, the anointed one, with perfect sincerity. Amen and amen. So next week we're going to pick up another book of the New Testament, and I'll try to make it connect to the Old Testament so you can learn what it really is about. The armor of God, you have to get out of your mind the Roman soldier costume. It's the priest who's interceding on the people's behalf uh, you know, attacking the accuser of the brethren. I'll close with this thought. Think about this. When the Garden of Eden was formed and Adam and was put in the garden, it says it's not good that he should be alone. Even though it's like me and Jesus, guess what? It's not good that you're alone. You still need someone else. And in the garden, it was Adam and God. It can't get better than that. But God, even though he was there with Adam, he said, it's still not good that he's alone. I think that's interesting. So he said, let's make a help meet. Help meet is totally misunderstood what that means. The Hebrew word is etzer, okay? And when you look at the ancient Hebrew language of each letter, it basically meant that the help meet is the one who sees the enemy coming. The women have the intuition. They can see the enemy coming that the man doesn't see. Man is working the field. She's to watch his back. And who was the first one to see the serpent? Eve was. Okay? Now, what's fascinating about that is that Eve was to protect Adam. Isn't that interesting? That's why in a Jewish wedding... She goes around him seven times. She's building a wall of protection around him, which comes from Jeremiah. Um, But what I think is so important is we need to realize we need each other. That's what we really do. Now, when you think about that, when God, before he created Eve, he brought him all these other animals, right? And Adam said, none of these can protect me, right? Right? What guy wouldn't want a lion, a tiger, a bear, or a T-Rex to protect him? I mean, man, I'll take a T-Rex, you know. None of those were qualified to protect him. Only a woman was qualified. Why? Because of the nature of the enemy. What good does T-Rex do against a serpent, Satan? We think so many things can protect us that don't protect us. And so that's what we have to realize who our enemy is. If we have, if it's a spiritual battle, you can't depend on a T-Rex. You have, are you following me? You're getting it. So we got to understand the nature of the battle that we're in. With that said, let's stand. Now, don't forget, tomorrow at noon is Kaim Eisen Zoom teaching. You've got to sign up for the Kaim Eisen to get the link so you can go. Uh, you're going to love it. Avinu Mokainu, Father King, we just thank you so much that we can come and learn about you. We're about to enter the battle and war of our lives of all of human history. So, Father, I want your people armed and trained and ready to go into the battle. We know Amalek is going to come and attack all those who are feeble and weak and elderly and at the behind. But, Father, we want to uh, put our armies even at the back as well as the front. We want to put the shield of you around all of us. Father, we want to fight this battle knowing that we're going to fight it properly so we win this battle. 
But we also know the battle is the Lord's and the victory is ours. So, Father, I just pray right now, all those that are listening, that they would experience that victory, uh, especially over this next year with everything that's coming. We pray, Lord, that everyone would be able to stand. And we thank you, Lord, that you not only want to bless us, you want to put your name on us. Talk about armor. Even as you told Aaron to say, Ivarekaka Adonai Baish Mareka, Ya'er Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka. Ye saw Adonai Panavileka Vyasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Eyeh Asher Eyeh. Amen. See you next week. <laughs>